conforming. Take my will and mold it, transform it to yours, to yours, O oh Lord. Holiness, holiness is what I long for. Holiness is what I need. Holiness, holiness is what you want for me. Good morning, good morning, good morning. And welcome, welcome, welcome to Daring Dialogues. I am your host, Shantae Charles. I hope that everyone has had a great and wonderful weekend. I hope that everybody is having a great start to their day. Just want to remind those of you uh, who follow me on my personal pages. I know people send me things all throughout the night. Um, sometimes I reciprocate by sending some things back to people. Um, <clears throat> depending on how, how late I'm up uh, in the morning. Uh, but I do want to let you know that I don't check my social media until after my broadcast so if you're sending me something for let's say you're sending me something for wednesday try to send it to me before midnight and or tuesday try to send it before midnight that way i will get a chance to actually read it or take a look at it and see if it's something that i can bring up on the broadcast so if you're sending something to me right before the broadcast comes on um, chances are I have not seen it yet because I deliberately do not check my social media before I start a bro broadcast because I don't want to be distracted all right and so um, I get prayer requests all the time generally I try to um, minister with prayer requests between midnight and 3 a.m. So if you have a prayer request, you can always send it to me. Um, but just know that that is the time that I kind of carve out to do intercession. All right. So good morning to each and every one of you who are on today. Please put the hearts on the screen and let me know if you can see and hear me clearly. If you can see and hear me clearly, press the hearts on the screen. My YouTube is also running. So um, if you are having trouble on the Periscope, you can go to our U my YouTube. All right. So I don't see anyone commenting or pressing hearts on the screen. So let me back out of Periscope and try to come back in. All right. If you all can bear with me for just a Take minute. My heart. Let's try this again. Let's try our periscope again. Okay. Come on, numbers. All right. <clears throat> All right. Can everyone see and hear me clearly this time? If you can see and hear me clearly, if you can see and hear me clearly, go ahead and press the hearts. I want to make sure that my broadcast is not great. All right. I want to make sure this is not stopping or freezing. So, good morning. Just reiterating for Periscope listeners who are just coming in. I tend to not check my social media until after Daring Dialogues broadcast. If you want to send me articles in relation to um, one of the topics for the week, 
you know, Tuesdays we're covering Black History. We'll be back looking at constitutional things uh, on Tuesday for Black people. Um, Wednesday, we're covering relationships. We'll be in this book again, 11. Um, Thursday is Thinking Thursday, Theology Thursday. We're talking about how Africa shaped the Christian mind. And Friday is Health and Wealth. We're talking about wealth concepts as well as things to do with your credit score and talking about the things that we eat that have for many years been considered bad foods or bad ingredients. So if you have anything to share on those topics, try to share it before or try to send me an article at reachshantae at gmail.com or if you are connected to me by Facebook, you can inbox me. Um, try to send those articles and things before midnight. Otherwise, I'm not going to see them until after the broadcast. So good morning to everyone. Good morning, hubby bubby. Good morning, Prophet Jonathan. Good morning, Lady Evelyn. Good morning, uh, Lady Barbara. And each and every one of you who are joining us, let me go ahead and jump right in since we are a few minutes behind due to some technicality stuff. All right, so Tony Evans, Kingdom Disciples, is where we are today. We've been talking about developing a deep intimacy with God. Developing a deep intimacy with God. And uh, we should complete this chapter. So one thing I want to say about developing a deep intimacy with God the first thing I want to say before we even get into this reading is sometimes it is kind of on the easy side to tell whether or not someone has developed an intimacy with God. The main way we can tell that you developed an intimacy with God or not, good morning, Pastor Ben, the main way we can tell is how you treat your fellow human beings. Good morning, Lady Rivonda. That's the main way we can tell. How do you treat your fellow human beings? Because truly, if you have a relationship with God, he has in some way, shape, or form expressed to you the importance of understanding that every soul created on this planet is created in his likeness and in his image. So if I understand that fundamentally, and I say, I love God. You don't love God? What's wrong with you? If I, if I love God, then that means that I love the souls that are created in his image. And if I love the souls that are created in his image, then there's a certain way that I'm going to treat the souls that are created in his image simply because God made them and I love God. See, it goes back to that. So if I love him, then that, I, that means that I don't go around doing harm to what God created. I know we get this, we get this right when it comes to animals, right? We got whole campaigns <laughs> on animal rights and how to treat animals. We have whole campaigns. Good morning, prophet, apostle, lady, uh, apostle. We have whole campaigns on how to treat animals. We have whole campaigns on how we need to improve our, treat, our treatment of the environment. But when it comes down to the simple campaign of how we should be treating each other as human beings, that seems to be where we fall off. And I'm just trying to understand, for the people who say they love God, you don't love God, what's wrong with you? I'm trying to figure out why you don't understand that to love God a part of loving God is to also love the people he created. And even if you are a racist and you say, well, those people aren't really human to me. They're animals. Okay. God still created animals. So now what's your excuse? Again, your logic still doesn't add up as to why you would treat someone in a dishonorable way way which god do they love very good question lady apostle so as we jump into this as we finish up this chapter 
we're talking about developing a deep intimacy with God. And to me, it is very obvious who has developed a deep intimacy with God. Good morning, living my best life. Who has developed a deep intimacy with God? Because if you're that close to the heart of God, then you know how deeply God feels about the people that he created. So whether you like them or not, or whether your personalities gel with them or not, there's just certain things you just don't do to people because you say you have the heart of God. And you say that you've been in his presence. And you say that you know the heart of God. Well, if you know the heart of God, then you know that the people that he created literally came out of his heart. So how can you say you have the heart of God and you don't treat people right or you don't treat them right on a consistent basis? Or you immediately fly off the handle and disconnect yourself from fellow human beings the moment somebody does the slightest thing to you. All right. So now we have to we have to ask ourselves, am I maturing in this intimacy with God or am I still on milk? Am I still on milk? Because I can tell you just from my own life experience, anytime somebody has done something to me that I have thought was like, oh, my gosh, I cannot believe this person just did this. The heart of God immediately reaches out to me. First of all, the heart of God immediately reaches out to me to bring comfort to me. <laughs> Thank God for that. The Holy Spirit begins to comfort me with the comfort that only God can give in a situation. And then the Holy Spirit immediately begins to start ministering to my heart. Why? Because the scripture talks about the fact that that the time will come when the hearts of men will grow cold. When love for each other will grow cold. And the only way you're going to stop your heart from growing cold is to stay in the love of God. People are around here. People are doing some really offensive things. Some people are doing some offensive things in the name of God. We see it all going all across television. People are doing offensive things in the name of God. And if you know God, you know that God is not leading them to do those things, right? People are committing abuses while they're saying they serve God. You know they're not serving God because God would not put you out here to be abusing people. So the only way that you're going to combat, right, that reactionary disgust that you feel because now you have people, if you look on the internet at some of these articles, just go read some of the comments underneath. You will start to see people say things like, I hate human beings or I hate humanity. Humanity disgusts me. I'm sick and tired of humanity. Well, listen, if you have the heart of God, you can't be sick and tired of humanity. Good morning, Lady Judy. You can't be sick and tired of humanity if, keyword, if you have the heart of God. Because God's heart beats eternally for his creation. His love is eternal for his creation. This is why we have to stay in the love of God. Because guess what? Our love ain't going to cut it. I'm just going to be honest. Some people I would have um, put in, put in, a, put in, a, folded up in a little letter, sealed it up and sent them back to God a long time ago. <laughs> I would have just said, here, God, you can have this back. You, you, you can have it back. Yeah, that's what I would have done. I'm just being honest. Some people I would have set them out to the curve a long time ago. If you were depending on my brand of love, I would have set you out to the curve a long time ago. Living my best life says we must do like the Bible says and count the cost and fall in the ground. 
be like a seed that is falling into the ground and dies. Yes. All right. So fall in the ground like a seed and die. Offenses will come. Yes. Lady Rhonda says our love has conditions. I'm reading from YouTube. All right. So what am I saying? You have to stay in the eternal love of God. Because when your patience with people is run out, when your compassion with people is run out, when your long suffering runs out, I am hoping and praying that you have the Holy Spirit who is eternal, who helps you to keep going in the love of God. Because if you don't, I'm already telling you now, if you don't, the season that is coming, it's really going to be hard for you to genuinely love people. It is. It's going to be hard for you to genuinely love people if you do not stay in the love of God. So, again, when people say that I know him, I have fellowship with God, and then 30 seconds later, they cussing you out. No, ma'am, no, sir. You don't know him. You don't know him. You don't know him as well as you think you do. You don't. Because if you knew him and you were in him, what's in him, right, which is eternal and ongoing and consistent, would be in you. As the song says, they just need a little more Jesus. <laughs> and so every day I say, Father, keep me in your love. Your love never fails. Your love never runs out on me. I don't want to be a wishy-washy saint. I don't want to be a halfway in, halfway out believer. I don't want to be one way over here and then another way over here. I don't want to be kind to this sector of people and then really gr grimy and nasty to this sector of people. Because all of that is going to reflect on the God that I say lives on the inside of me. God is not schizophrenic. He's not. God is consistent in all of his ways. So even on today, I encourage you that if you find yourself being more wishy-washy and more inconsistent than not, go back into your prayer closet and say, Father, I want to make sure that my character, my nature is exhibiting who you are. I get it wrong all the time. But you are the one living on the inside of me and I have yielded to you living through me. I know that I'm not a perfect vessel, but I know that I have yielded myself to allow you to live through me. So help me be a better representation that you are truly living in me and you're truly living through me. Right? Help me to show a level of mercy a level of forgiveness, a level of compassion that people will be able to look at me and say, you know, nobody has ever really taken a chance on me like this. I know it must be God. Nobody has ever really shown me this measure of kindness. I know it must be God. Nobody has ever really loved me into transformation and change. I know this must be God. They've maybe beat me into transformation and change. They've maybe cursed me out into transformation and change, right? They've maybe berated me and nagged me into transformation and change, but I've never had somebody actually love me into being a better person who wants to see me succeed, who wants to see me grow, who wants to see me prosper. I've never had a relationship with somebody who only wants the best for me and nothing evil. I've never had a relationship with someone who only speaks the truth to me and does not want to harm me. That's the kind of person that everybody wants and needs in their life. So let's see what Tony Evans says today about that I may know him. This brings us to Philippians 3 and 10. If you need a verse, if you need a verse to build your life around, he says, this is it. If you want a pursuit to focus the rest of your life on, 
There is no better one than this, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death. Kingdom disciples pursue knowing Christ intimately. Paul once made a very interesting statement in regard to his knowledge of Christ. The apostle said, even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know him in this way no longer. 2 Corinthians 5.17 Before his conversion, Paul knew about Christ in the sense that he had heard about this man Jesus and perhaps had even seen him once. But after becoming a Christian, Paul truly came to know the Lord and his previous casual knowledge was erased because he became a brand new creation. Paul came face to face with resurrection power. Why is it that some Christians have victory while others live defeated? The answer isn't in their circumstances necessarily because victorious Christians and defeated Christians face the same kinds of trials. The answer isn't in who goes to church more often or who reads the Bible more. The answer is that victorious Christians know Christ more intimately and thus experience his resurrection power, the kingdom authority that is transferred to kingdom disciples. A lot of us would like to put a period after the phrase, the power of his resurrection in Philippians 3 and 10. But if we are going to know Christ with the kind of intimacy that draws us close, we must know him also in the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death. You know, there are certain things in this life that happen to us that will literally make us feel as if we are dying while we're yet breathing. Um, sometimes that can be the death of a loved one. It can be a tragic event that occurs in your life that flips your life upside down. It is in those moments that God comes and comforts us and says, I know this pain. I feel this pain. Sometimes the pain can be so intense that you don't even have the words to describe the pain that you feel, maybe at the loss of a loved one or over, over a tragic event. Sometimes the pain in our life leaves us breathless. Sometimes the pain in our life leaves us speechless. We just don't have the words. We can't form the words to express to other people what is going on on the inside of us. That is when the Holy Spirit comes and he begins to minister to us. And he begins to say, yeah, Jesus felt that. There was a time when Jesus opened not his mouth. Sometimes we don't understand why Jesus didn't open his mouth. But there are some things that happen in our life that sometimes takes our breath away. Sometimes leaves us speechless. It is in those times when we draw near to God rather than running away from God when we draw near to him, that we begin to understand an inkling of the suffering that Jesus has endured. Because remember, when Jesus was crucified, he was not just enduring the crucifixion of the moment. He was not just enduring the pain of the crucifixion. He was also enduring the pain of every human soul that had been, that was, and that would come into the earth. So, when it says we must know him in the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death, there are some things that you learn in the death process. There are some things that you learn in dying to your own will. There are some things that you learn in dying to what you want to do in life, right? There are some things that you learn in, in your ego taking that death in in the humiliation that comes sometimes with life's trials, there's some things that you learn in that that you won't ever learn if you're always on the mountaintop. Oh, Lord. Everybody wants a revelation about life in Christ. <laughs> but many people say, oh, all that stuff about conform to his death? Oh, no, I'll bypass all of that. I'll, I'll bypass it. I'll, I'll, I'll bypass it. I'll take a rain check, right? Some of us want to take a rain check on trials, but trials come to make you strong. Trials come 
to help you know Christ in his fullness, not just in his glorified self, but in his suffering, being conformed to the image of the Son. The image of the Son is not just the glory, it's also the gory. The image of the Son is not just the crown, it's also the cross. The image of the Son is not just, Hosanna, you're great, you're wonderful, but crucify him. So I I want to I want to say this but I don't want to I don't want people to think I'm being um how can I say it? Let me just say it. Help me Holy Spirit. I dare say that you still have some more maturing to go. I'll put it that way. You might have some more maturing to do if you have only tasted Hosanna, and you have never tasted the side of this Christian life where people are literally saying, crucify him or her. And so <clears throat> when I see people writing books out of the Hosanna side of their life, I pray for them. Because whatever you write on the Hosanna side is going to need to keep you on the crucifixion side. This is why I don't advise people, if you are newly married, you married five years and below, put down the pen. You might not want to write a book about marriage just yet. <laughs> All right. Again. If you're writing from the hallelujah side, the Hosanna side, whatever you write on the Hosanna side has got to keep you and you have to still be consistent with that on the crucify him or her side. That means that when I pick up my work, when I pick up my work of what I said about the Lord, it still has to hold true when they say crucify her. Because you will be tested, right? If you haven't been tested yet in your Christian walk, keep living. You will be tested. You will be tested on every word you speak. <laughs> you will be tested on the things that you said about the Lord. You will be tested on your, in your love, your compassion, your mercy, your forgiveness, your long suffering. All of those things about your walk is going to be tested. Jesus was tested. Do we forget that the people who were standing around while he was being crucified? Oh, let's just, let's, let's, let's put that plug in there. Thank you, Holy Spirit. You do realize that you can draw an audience while you're being crucified, right? See, they didn't have social media in Jesus' day. We would have called that the fan base that came to see you be crucified. Jesus had a fan base of people who came to see him be crucified. In today's terminology, we would have called them the trollers, right? We would have called them the ones who just sat there and observed. The ones that we want to tell to scroll on by. No, they weren't scrolling. They went there to the cross and they trolled Jesus at the cross while he was being crucified. That's what happened. While he was being crucified, they said, if you are who you say you are, why don't you just come down? I mean, you say you're the son of God. Why don't you come down off that cross? But guess what? This was one time that coming down would not have benefited eternity. Because that coming down would have been out of pride. And that coming down 
would have been out of, let me show you who I really am. I am God of all creation. So when people tell you to come down, you better discern what's behind that command. Sometimes when God is holding us up, <laughs> when God is holding us up for crucifixion and people are saying, girl, you don't have to take that. Just tell them off. Just tell them who you are. Just tell them how you really, how you really feel. Get all in your feelings, right? We better discern who's telling us to come down and why. Sometimes you being lifted up and stretched high is exactly where God wants you. He says, we are called to share in Christ's sufferings. For Paul, having fellowship with Christ in his sufferings meant severe persecution, numerous hardships, and finally martyrdom. But it also meant a special kind of intimacy and authority with the Lord that can't be known any other way. If you have ever suffered deeply with another person, you know what I'm talking about. We'll never be truly intimate with someone else if we say to that person, I only want to share the good times with you, keep your suffering to yourself. So many believers today want to know the five things they can do to achieve spiritual victory and exercise spiritual authority as a disciple or the four steps to peace. Or do you have a prophetic word for me? No? Okay, I'll check back in 48 hours. Do you have a prophetic word for me? No? Okay, I'll check back in 72 hours. Do you have a prophetic word for me? You know what my prophetic word is? Study Christ. The testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Father, Father. 99% of the words that we see online can be found in the Holy Scriptures. Oh my gosh, that's such an awesome revelation. It's the Scripture. But you would know it was the Scripture if you were reading your word. Hopefully I'm helping somebody today. Some of these prophets are out here speaking the scriptures and putting their name on it. <laughs> and people are going wild. I mean, they're going crazy. They're throwing money at them and everything. And I'm like, do these people not know that they just quoted the scripture? They just quoted the scripture and put their name on it, which is plagiarism, by the way. But they just quoted the scripture and put their name on it. And you think they got a, some kind of divine revelation. Well, they did get a divine revelation. They opened their Bible. They just plagiarized. They opened their Bible, though, and took out what was already there and put it on their Facebook page. And now you think they're a wonder, but they're not a wonder. They just read the scripture and reiterated it to you. And then they put their name down there as if they had written it. Yeah, I know there are people who do that. It's dangerous practice by the way, attribute to God what is God's. The American way is just give me a list of things to do and I'll knock myself out doing them. Give me three steps, seven steps, 12 steps, and I'll knock myself out doing it. Don't misunderstand. Nothing I'm saying about performance-oriented discipleship is meant to imply that we don't have to do anything as believers. God has prepared us to do good works, Ephesians 2 and 10. And there may well be four or five things that we should stop doing or start doing to strengthen our life with Christ. The problem is that we attribute our lists a power that they don't have. Suppose someone says to me, Tony, give me a list of five things I can do to be a better Christian. 
So I give them a list of the basic stuff like reading his Bible, spending time in prayer. And then I call them two weeks later to see how it's going. Not really any better, they tell me. I already knew about the stuff on that list. I just can't seem to pull them off consistently. This imaginary person's problem is our problem too. Many times we know what to do in order to build the intimacy that we need to have with Christ. The issue is where we get the power to do what we know. The Bible says the power comes in the relationship. The power comes when the living word, Jesus the Christ, reaches the implanted word in our soul. The power comes through abiding in Christ. The scripture says that the Holy Spirit will bring all things back to our remembrance, right? The things that we should know, the things that Jesus has said and spoken. Well, how is he going to bring it back to our remembrance if we're not putting anything in our memory bank? And so if we're in the word every single day and we're putting the word in our memory bank, then that's when you're going through a situation or a circumstance or trying to make a hard decision in life and the Holy Spirit can reach into your memory bank and he can pull up the word that you need that coincides or aligns with the situation or the circumstance or the problem that you're trying to solve in life. But if you haven't done the first thing, which is deposit the word into your memory bank, then what is the Holy Spirit pulling from? And then this is when, as Lady Apostle wonderfully says, this is when we get into spooky prophetics. And spooky prophetics has you doing things that do not coincide and align with the word of God. How many of us rely on something told me versus I know this is the Holy Spirit because I know how the word of God speaks. And this is the Holy Spirit speaking the word of God. I don't need any more something told me moments in life. What I want is I want to be assured that the Holy Spirit is speaking. And the only way I can be assured that the Holy Spirit is speaking is that I must begin to know and study the word of God. Why? Because the Holy Spirit is going to speak what Christ has said. He's not going to speak something that's not scriptural and that doesn't align. All right? Lastly, abiding in the vine. Jesus spoke the words in John 15 in the upper room just before his crucifixion, probably the most intimate setting we are told about in scripture. With his disciples close around him and John leaning on him, Jesus said, Jesus said, I am the true vine. Let's stop right there. If you are under a leader who is making himself the vine, you're already in trouble. If you are under a leader who thinks he is baby Jesus, if you're under a leader who thinks he is Jesus Jr., you're already in trouble. If you're out here tattooing your leader's name on your body, if you're tattooing church logos on your body, you're already in trouble. Let me just say that. There is but one true vine and his name is Jesus the Christ. Let me read it one more time. Jesus said, I am the true vine. And my father is the vine dresser. Notice there's no other preacher's name in that sentence. No matter how wonderful we are, how charismatic we are, 
We're not baby Jesus and we're not the father. One more time. I'm going to read one more time. Jesus said, I am the true vine and my father is the vine dresser. Listen, every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. God does the taking away, not us. God does the taking away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes it so that it may bear more fruit. So you might be going through a pruning in your life. God may be pruning some things off of you that's not bearing and producing the kind of fruit that he wants. But again, God does the pruning. God does the pruning. How do I know that it's that it's that it's a supernatural thing that he's doing? Cuz I don't have to tell it to go nowhere. It starts falling off. So Jesus said, I'm the true vine. My father is the vine dresser. He's the one that's caring for the vine. If we are not on the vine where Jesus is the true vine, anything is liable to happen to that vine. Jesus's vine is the vine that bears fruit and the vine that is pruned so that it can bear more fruit. How do I know I'm on the right vine? I know I'm on the right vine because my life is bearing the fruit of God. And even when I'm pruned, even when I'm cut back, even when things start falling off that don't need to be in my life, it's only falling off so that I can bear more fruit. It's not falling off to kill me. It's not falling off to destroy me. It's not falling off to condemn me. It's not falling off to curse me to hell. None of that stuff is going on in the vine. None of that is going on in the vine. Can I say that one more time? If God is pruning you, he is pruning you so that you can bear more fruit. Not so that you can be punished. He's doing a work to get you to bear more fruit. He's not pruning you to condemn you, to curse you to hell. None of that. He's only pruning you so that you can bear more fruit. So now you have to say, what is going on in my life? I'm being cut back. But is fruit happening? Am I bearing fruit? Am I on the right vine? Jesus used a familiar illustration to make this point. The disciples knew all about vines and fruit. The question was then, how were they to produce the fruit that God desired? How am I going to produce this fruit? Guess what? You don't need a $1,000 money line to get this secret. I'm about to tell you for free. Jesus said, abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. So neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Apart from God, guess what? We start manufacturing false fruit. In Christ, fruit naturally comes. Fruit has three key characteristics. First, it always bears the character of the tree of which, is it, which it is a part. You're not going to find pears on an apple tree. Second, fruit is always visible. Third, fruit exists for the benefit of others. Fruit that eats itself is called rotten fruit. 
Oh, God. A fruit becomes rotten because it's consuming itself. Therefore, kingdom disciples make disciples, producing fruit in the lives of others. Authority in prayer is the practical manifestation and result of the transfer of kingdom authority. Jesus says that those believers who possess an intimacy with him gets heaven's response to their prayers. You want heaven's response? Abide in Christ. You want heaven's response? Begin to speak the things that heaven is already saying. Heaven obligates itself to respond to believers who function as kingdom disciples when they invoke God's presence in the affairs of this life. For kingdom disciples, seeing the supernatural operating in the natural is not to be an occasional event. Answered prayer for kingdom disciples is part of the legal right bequeathed to those who legitimately exercise the authority granted to them based on the level of their relational commitment to the Savior. How committed to you uh, to Christ are you? The key is in your connection to Christ. As branches, we bear fruit, but the life-giving substance flows to you from the vine. So when I, so when I don't have that connection with Christ, that means that the life-giving substance that was flowing from the vine to the branches is no longer flowing. And when something is no longer flowing, then that branch starts to dry up and wither. All right? And so when we see things drying up and withering, then we see what happens when people start to dry up and wither and they're no longer connected to the vine. They start manufacturing fruit. Because why? The fruit is supposed to be produced for others. So if I'm no longer connected to Christ, I have to manufacture something to draw people to still come to my withered branch. But once people get there and you have manufactured fruit, and once people get there and they bite into your fruit and they find out it's rotten, or it's one of those plastic fruits, you know how you're, your, your grandmother and some of our parents would put those that nice little bowl on the table as display. <laughs> and it would be all looking so juicy, right? And we thought it was real fruit. And we would go up there and some of us would come in the house and be like, man, I'm so hungry. Oh, look at that bowl of fruit. <laughs> but if you lived in the house, whole other revelation there. If you lived in the house, you knew the fruit wasn't real. Mm -mm -mm. my God, if you lived in the house, you knew the fruit wasn't real. So when your friends came over and they attempted to go ahead and grab that fruit, some of us who wanted to play jokes on our friends would actually stand there and let them grab it and try to try to bite into it. Mm hmm. Yeah, we would. Yeah, we would. And be like, ha, gotcha. <laughs> I know you thought it was real, didn't it? Ah, no, you thought it was real. It looked so good. It looked refreshing. It looked almost to be the truth, but it was manufactured fruit. And unfortunately, that's what's happening in a lot of places. The, the branch has dried up and withered. And on the end of that dried up and withered branch is manufactured fruit. And it looks real good on the outside. Until you get into the house, you sign up, you join, and you start biting into that fruit and you realize, oh God, what did I just do? This fruit is manufactured. This fruit is rotten. This fruit is not real. And then you turn and you look around and you say, wait a minute. How do they have all these people in here eating manufactured fruit? So everybody in here is just pretending that this is real? that this is real fruit. Let me extricate myself from this now before I get further entangled. That's what's happening. People are, they see a branch, but if you look with your spiritual sight, you'll see, and you'll know that that branch is dried up and withered. 
But if you have no spiritual sight, you're going to go right to a dried, withered branch that has manufactured fruit on it. And you're going to bite in and you're going to find out that this branch was dead long ago. And people are still over here eating manufactured fruit. And some have convinced themselves that the fruit is real. So they're eating manufactured fruit. And now they're starting to dry up and wither away because their soul and their spirit has become malnourished. That is what happens when you eat fruit that's not real. So, as branches, you bear fruit. But the life-giving substance flows to you from the vine. Anytime you try to produce fruit on your own, it's going to lack the necessary nutrients and power to produce fruit that lasts. Abiding in Christ is another name for intimacy with Christ. Christ wants to express his life through you, which comes through your attachment to him. If your prayer life is just a matter of shooting up panicked emergency petitions when you're in trouble, you are missing this intimacy. If you have your devotions in the morning so you can get them out of the way just to say you did a devotion and get on with your day, you don't understand the process of abiding. If church is just your weekly time with God, you will bear little fruit. This is because abiding means just what it says. It means to remain, to stay, to keep the connection strong. It means you can take a deep breath and just get to know Jesus. It takes away all of the self-induced struggle. My God. Everybody talk about struggle love. You know what struggle love is? Trying to work to get this intimacy. Self-induced struggle. Get to know Jesus. Put aside all of the preconceived notions you have. I know for some of us this is hard. It may take a while. But put aside the preconceived notions about what Jesus is or who Jesus is. And how you're supposed to come in the three step, in the two step, in the 12 step. And just say, Father, here am I. Speak to me. I'm listening. Lay your burdens down. Tell them what's on your heart. Tell them what's on your mind. And then sit back and listen. And let God speak to your inner man. And as he speaks, for some of us, he may give us scripture. I remember when I first began to, to get into the process of prayer. And I was around people who I would call prayer marathon missionaries. <laughs> they could go into their closet and they could pray for hours and hours and hours three, four hours at a time. And I would look and I'd be like, man, what they doing in there? <laughs> oh, Lord, what are they doing in there for three hours? What are you doing? But as I began to grow in my understanding of what it meant to wait on the Lord, I realized that prayer was not a one-way conversation. That it was not expected for me to be talking the whole four hours or one hour or 30 minutes. Sometimes prayer is simply waiting on the Lord and attuning your ear. Getting out your journal and your pen and saying, I'm just going to wait on the Lord. And whatever he wants to say, I'm going to write it down. Whatever verse he wants to bring up, I'm going to write that down. And then I'm going to be diligent enough to take that verse and go and find it and go look at it. And then look at it and read it and read it and look at it and say, God, what are you trying to tell me in this verse? And so many years we have beat people up 
because they don't pray like we pray. They don't shout like we shout. They don't speak in tongues like we speak in tongues. They don't have a rhythm and a cadence that we have. Because you do realize God gives everybody their own rhythm and cadence, right? He's not calling us to be carbon copies. I can get up here and I can imitate a lot of people. I can imitate Juanita Bynum if I wanted to. I can imitate T.D. Jakes. I can imitate Kirk Franklin. I can imitate someone else's process, but that ain't my process. That would make me a counterfeit. So everybody has a rhythm and a cadence that God wants to develop for them in their prayer life. Christ wants to express his life through you, which comes through your attachment to him. If your prayer life, like I said, is just a matter of shooting panic petitions anytime you're in trouble, then you're going to need to develop your prayer life beyond using God as a 911 caller. <laughs> Some of us only use God like an emergency dispatch. Hello, 911? Yes, I got this problem over here. How soon can you get here? Please, please come right away. Come on right away. Do you realize God wants to be more than a 911 dispatch in your life? I'm just saying. <sighs> a young woman in our church, he says, after years of smoking, decided she wanted to kick the habit. She tried every stop smoking product on the market, but nothing worked. Finally, she decided that instead of focusing on all the things she was doing to quit smoking, she would fa focus on being in God's presence and getting to know him. Within 30 days, she had quit smoking because of the power of his presence. When you are close to Christ, you find what you need to overcome the struggles that you face. Not only that, you will experience doors opening for you that you never could have opened on your own. The story is told that a bulldog and a poodle were arguing one day. The bulldog was making fun of the poodle, calling him a weak little runt who couldn't do anything. Then the bulldog said, I challenge you to a contest. Let's see who can open the back door of their house the fastest and get inside. The bulldog was thinking he would turn the doorknob with his powerful jaws, open the door while the poodle was too small to even reach the knob on his back door. But to, the, but to the bulldog's surprise, the poodle said, I can get inside my house faster than you can. I accept the challenge. So with the poodle watching, the bulldog ran to the back door of his house, jumped up to the doorknob. He got his teeth and paws around the knob and tried to turn it, but he couldn't get enough of a grip on the knob to turn it. So finally he had to quit in exhaustion. Now it was the poodle's turn at his back door. Go ahead, you can't do it either, the bulldog growled, trying to soothe his wounded pride. The poodle went to the door and scratched a couple of times. The owner of the home not only opened the door, but lovingly picked the poodle up in his arms and carried him inside. The difference was in the relationship. Some of us are bulldog Christians. <laughs> oh, Lord. Some of us are bulldog Christians. It's all grunting and growling and trying and scraping and yanking when Christ simply wants us to come close to him. Get close to Christ as his disciple and he will amaze you with what he will do both in and through you. Some of us know that all we have to do is knock. The process of intimacy, and I'm closing Oh gosh, I'm not closing. <laughs> the process of intimacy. I'm going to read this just one paragraph and then we're going to stop here. So we'll be back in intimacy one more time on Monday of next week. This section may sound unusual because intimacy seems like one of those things that should just happen spontaneously without any real direction. Wrong. Ask any married couple if deep, satisfying, emotional, spiritual, or physical intimacy happens magically with no effort on the part of either spouse. 
they will tell you it doesn't work that way. There is a process of intimacy with Jesus, and we looked at it in the previous chapter when we touched on receiving the word implanted, which is able to save your souls. Jesus added this next statement when he was talking to his disciples about abiding. He included a very important element when he said, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, comma, which means all of this is all tied together. Ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. Let me go to my John 15, 7 over here as we close. Had to break out my scriptures. <laughs> John 15, 7. Mm -mm. I feel a little low again, yeah. If you remain in me and follow my teachings, you can ask anything you want and it will be given to you. T.I. was not the first one to say you can have whatever you like. <laughs> Woo, people just be stealing God's words. No, I'm just kidding. But no, he said, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, my, my, just right there alone should make everybody want to be a Bible fanatic reader. He said, one more time, if you abide in me and my words plural, abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that is alluding to the fact that when you get so full of the word of God, that when you begin to speak, you begin to speak in alignment with what you're full of. And if you're speaking in alignment with what you're full of, then what you're full of will begin to manifest in your life. Somebody correct me if I'm wrong. I'm just saying. He said you can ask for whatever you will. And it will be done for you. Will be. Not maybe kind of sort of shoulda, woulda, coulda, possible could be done. He said it will be done for you. So my question as we close is, what in the world is stopping you from getting filled with the word? What could be more important if I want things to be done for me? What could be more important than getting the word of God in me? So it can abide in me and remain in me and stay in me. He says that if we abide or remain in him and keep his words in us, then we can ask whatever we want and it will be done. Why? Because if his word is truly in me, then I'm really not trying to ask for something outside of what's in me. Oh gosh. I'm not trying to ask for, for, something to manifest outside of me that's not in me. One more time. God can trust me to manifest something outside of myself when myself is actually full of his word. So he knows I'm not going to ask for anything cray cray for him to manifest if I am full of his word because his word is going to give me what to ask for that's not going to bring damage to you, to myself, to the environment I'm in, to leadership. Anything that I'm asking for when I'm full of his word is going to be for the good of people and not for the evil of mankind. Does that make sense? We can ask to be set free from an addiction, a wrong attitude, oppressive relationships, anything that is contrary to his will. If I've got his word in me, then that means I have his will in me. 
And if I have his will in me, then I can ask whatever I will because his will is what's in me. Make sense? So if I don't have the word in me, it's going to be hard for me to know his will, which means it's going to be hard for me to ask what his will is. And this is where we get into asking a miss. <laughs> we start asking a miss, meaning we miss what his will would actually have us to ask for. We can ask for a promotion, a dream, a destiny, but here's the question. How do I get his words to remain in me? How do I get his words to reach deep down into that level we talked about earlier where the seed has been planted, where it will make a difference so that I will become what I was redeemed to be? Oh gosh, some of us are becoming, but we're not becoming what we were redeemed to be. We're not becoming what God sent us to this earth to become. I don't just want to become something. I want to become what God redeemed me to be. Becoming what God redeemed you to be is actually fulfilling your purpose and your destiny. How many people leave this earth without actually becoming what God intended for them to become? So we're going to stop there. Question, question. Are you becoming what God has redeemed you to become? Are you on your own little journey to become something? And God is looking at you saying, hmm. Okay, I see Shante is nowhere near conformed to the image of what I redeemed her to be. Hmm, how can we get her there? Let's see. I've got to prune this relationship. Yeah, I got to cut that back. Yeah, this person's got to go because 10 years down the line, she's really not going to become what I redeemed her to be because this person is going to be in direct opposition to that. Got to go. Remember, we're supposed to be conformed to the image of Christ. So whatever is in the way of that conforming, just know that it becomes an enemy to Christ. It becomes an enemy to God's plan, the real God's plan, not Drake, all right? It becomes an enemy to God's plan for who you were redeemed to become in the earth. This has been another episode of Daring Dialogues, and I've been your host today. Thank you for this extra time. Um, obviously, we didn't get to 11, but we will be back in 11 on Wednesday. All right, on Wednesday. So remember, light is the most daring opposition to darkness. So please go out today and be light. The best way to keep your light lit is to stay in the word, read the word, Meditate on the word and let his words abide in you. Thank you all so much for your time and attention. Take care. And God bless.